Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Button Mash, episode, wanna say, seven. The first episode, actually, of 2017, and my guest at this time is the CEO of Synergy KVM, Mr. Nick Bolton. How are you doing, sir? Hey, how's it going? Good, good. It's so ha- I'm so glad you are able to make the, uh, make the show today. As you and I were talking uh, off off camera... It feels like we've known each other for a long time and never actually really spoken. <laughs> the wonders of the internet. Indeed. So, Synergy KVM has been around for quite a while. In fact, it was actually my very first YouTube video I ever made. And I want to talk about probably just the... I want to get into the history of it. How did you get started with uh, with this software, with this company? In 2009... I started working on Synergy as a contributor. The project is open source and it had a a number of bugs that had been around for a while. And I spent some time on fixing them uh, because my background is a, a programmer. So after a while, I realized that I was pretty much the the only one working on the project full time. So I started asking for donations, managed to make enough money to quit my day job. And then a couple of years down the line, I started charging for access to the compiled binaries. And after a while, managed to make enough revenue to hire a team of developers. So that's where we're at now. We've got a team of, uh, well, we've got three developers right now working at the company and some other staff doing, uh, you know, helping run the business. And we're currently looking for two more developers to help us make some new products. Very cool. Are those kind of NDA products at the moment or? Are those a little bit more open to disclo- to disclosure? Well, we're going to put the product pages up on the website okay. in, in the next few days. So if you check out our website, there'll be some more information on there. Okay, about- very cool. I'm sure, I, I'm sure I'll probably have videos based on that. <laughs> yeah, the, the products are going to be focused around our mission statement as a company, which is to combine multiple devices into one cohesive experience. Okay. So as you know, Synergy lets you combine multiple computers into one experience by sharing one mouse and keyboard between them. So the other products will be along the same line of thinking. That's very cool. And Synergy's response has been really, really positive. Uh, in terms of just from what I've seen from tracking the Twitter stats and from the Twitter replies and all that, you guys have been very active in the community, accepting feedback, taking in suggestions, and overall, like, what made you? How do you gauge what you want to take from the from customers versus like, what, pretty much, what is contributions you take from ideas from them versus what do you look at and say like, that's not really our thing, and just kind of push it off to the side. Okay, so we look at what will benefit our customers as a whole and what will tie in with our vision for the product. Okay. It, like, I know one of the biggest uh, features that were added in the most, in one of the recent I- iterations of Synergy was the ability to copy, copy paste across screens. Cause I remember when I started, that wasn't really a feature and I think it came in in version like 1.8. Uh, that you added some it was something like that it was either fire file moving or it was something that you could do prior and it was kind of one of those features that just really helped propel the software even higher than it had already been well chris shoneman was the original author of synergy and he added in the copy paste feature quite some time ago but we uh recently added the file drag and drop feature That's in it. 1.8 yeah yeah, and I think that is just fantastic as a feature to have because it was one of the things that I know people were really saying that they wanted to have that ability to move files across computers. 
end if you've ever used the Windows Home uh, Home Group networking software. It is just awful at points. <laughs> the, we find that a lot of features for sharing information between computers, a lot of software that's available is not very seamless. There, there are a number of steps that you have to perform in order in, enable, to enable you to share data between the machines. So our philosophy is that we want to allow you to do this with as few steps as possible. It just so happens that the, the simplest way of doing this is just clicking dragging and letting go of, of your mouse uh, button right so so why not why not do that instead of having to organize the file into a folder and configure the sharing between the machines um, and then it, it seems to break every time you want to use it so we, we just thought well wouldn't it be easier if you could just drag a file between your machines oh absolutely no I totally agree with that I think it's just fantastic how hard was that of a feature to actually implement? Yeah, it's quite tricky because each platform, Windows, Mac, and Linux, have their own ways of handling dragging files. So you have to implement it on three different platforms, and then you have to make the three different platforms interoperate. Wow. That sounds like a mountain of work. <laughs> yeah, it's the same for every feature we, we develop. And then, of course, every year... Apple, Microsoft, and, and even the Linux community, uh, to their credit, innovate, which is a great thing. Um, but that also means that as, a, as developers that we have to catch up with that as well. So we have, as a, as a cross-platform company, we have to catch up three times. Right. So do you have like one poor soul who's just dedicated to tracking updates from each of these companies and relaying that information to you? Uh, pretty much everything we do as a company, we do as a team. Okay. So we, we share that responsibility. Oh, I think that's fantastic. That's a that's a very good way to go about things. Help disperse the load a little bit. Speaking of, you mentioned that you wanted the goal of the software to be a seamless transition. And to that effect, you actually renamed the software to Seamless from Synergy. Okay, so that's a, a, a common uh, misconception is that we renamed the product. So the product is actually still called Synergy, but our company is called Seamless. Why the dis why the difference between the two? Because wasn't both companies just named Synergy? At yeah, one? our company used to be called Synergy, and the product used to be called Synergy, but we decided um, a while ago that we wanted to diversify our product range okay and of course like i said the products are still around the same goal of, of using multiple devices together and we wanted the new products to have their own names and their, and so we figured that of course synergy would be a product in its own right and the new products will have their own names. And therefore, as a company, we need to distinguish ourselves as uh, a separate name as well. Right. So that people can know that we're seamless, we develop Synergy, and these other products. Okay. Okay. So that makes that makes more sense. Because I was always wondering about that myself. About This is, this is why we're, we're looking for a, a marketing uh, yeah. professional to come and work for us. Is because as a programmer, I... I'm probably not the best person to market the company. So we need we need more people to help us out with that. Yes, and we'll definitely be talking about that afterwards too. And speaking of actually the people that work at Synergy, I've known you for pretty much since I started in media content, at least in, at least in the current iteration that I'm doing it now. And then through you, I also met uh, Weiss, or Wesley, who was one of your who's one of your customer service people, and the entire team at Synergy, from everyone who I've ever interacted with, have just been so helpful. And I want to know, like, because I know it's a very small team that that does the entire thing. So on social media too, like on your Twitter feed, like I said, you guys have always been very interactive with your consumer base when people have launched uh, tweets at you saying, you know, why is this here or that you have always been very receptive to it. And is it the same team or is it like individual people 
that you have set up for like social media versus your customer service or is it like the same set of people currently i'm running the social media okay and right now yes we do we do have uh separate stuff to manage the support okay uh Going through the tweets, I did allow, since this morning, I've been telling people to submit their questions using the hashtag Seamless and Synergy, just so if they had anything they wanted to ask. But going through the going through the Twitter feed, one of the biggest things that arised in the last week was the difference between the pro version and the consumer line. And I remember when Synergy at one point was, I think, $10, and then it did evolve in with the price tag and that changed up from the pro and the consumer line, you, you split them, which was good. So the one that one user had, had a opinion about the SSL certification on it saying he, it's not a feature that, you know, you should be charging for. I, I see the stance synergy took on it. And I actually agree with it because the way I the way I was when we were talking about to my viewers on on the daily chat talk show was we were like oh, I see it because on a company level that's something that you would be concerned about whereas at home not so much <laughs> like if SSL certification on the KVM is your biggest worry at home you probably have other things to worry about <laughs> so uh, I, based on that. What, and I saw your response to it, and you were incredibly professional about the entire thing. Even through the brashness of the of the Twitter user, you were unimaginably classy in the way you handled the situation. But Thanks. I want to know, was there any kind of uh, evolution in the thought process of what's going to happen with the versions of Synergy or Seamless in the coming in the coming months or in the coming versions? So the reason why SSL is a, a pro feature is simply because it's the latest feature that we added. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, we had a version of Synergy called Premium, which is where you got the latest feature that we added as a, a benefit of being a premium user. So it, it's kind of a, a, a legacy from, from that edition. So... What we do want to do going forward is move some of the features from the basic edition into the pro edition. But of course, for existing basic users, we'll still offer them the existing basic offering. Okay. So is it so from how I understand it, then you're gonna have a cascading kind of kind of sloping effect where when you have a new feature then the old features are going to get moved down into the basic and kind of get rolled in. Do I have that correct? Yeah, well, that's how we that's how we used to do it. Okay. Um, we're going to change our model, and essentially we're going to have all of the features which are pro features, so drag and drop. Um, maybe not SSL. We're maybe going to move that into basic. Okay. Uh, it's been quite a popular request for users, so... Um, but we are we are planning on adding a, a bunch of new features as well. So something that we are working on is the feature to drag windows between computers. Oh, okay. So that will be in the product in the next 12 months, we expect. And that will definitely be a pro feature. Oh, okay, yes. Ab absolutely. I can totally yeah. get behind something like that. So you get the idea. So oh, there, will yeah. be, there will obviously be some pro features and what like because right now it's kind of weird the way that we uh offer only ssl as the only thing that's different between basic and pro but like i said it's kind of a legacy thing so we want to we want to make it more of a, a traditional um product edition matrix and have a, a a nice balance between basic and pro features right uh, so how would you how would you respond to the just overwhelming positive support that just people post for their love of the product yeah, every day or at least at, if not every day, at least once or twice a week, I see a picture of a developer saying, I absolutely love this software. And in fact, there was one picture I just saw when I was looking up the hashtag seamless 
of a developer having his laptop and then Synergy running up to a TV that was a solid 10 feet away. Yeah. And the TV had to be at least 50 inches. And yeah. just saying, I absolutely love this software. Like, how do you reply to that? How, how do you... What does it make you feel like when you see people admiring your work and your software to this level? Well, really, we're always amazed by the very creative ways in which people use Synergy. So I went to a, a customer, a, a rather large hosting company that was using Synergy in their command center, and they would have a, uh, a big screen at, in the command room at, at the end of the room and a bunch of uh, other machines in like rows of desks looking at the screen. And they would use Synergy to control the big screen at the front from their desktops. And it's like, I kind of didn't really think of using Synergy in that way until I saw it. And that gave me an idea for another product. And of course, you know, so our users do drive a lot of the innovation themselves because, of course, most of our, most of our users are actually programmers. So that obviously incredibly smart people, right. incredibly creative people, and they they will always come up with very interesting ways to use the products and, and that the it's really, really valuable to us to see how they're using it. So whenever I see a, a, a picture of how somebody is using Synergy, I get really excited because it gives me an idea of how I can then help other people uh, more easily achieve whatever solution they've they've invented and of course because the software is open source yes uh, it makes it a lot easier for uh, hackers to create their own solutions with synergy so have you uh, speaking of the open source model and the fact that you can modify the software to a degree have you ever seen somebody who says hey i took the code and i morphed it this way and this way i have it do now and you've looked at it and be like that's a very cool idea. Can we use that in our official release? Have, has that kind of yeah. situation ever happened? Absolutely. So there's a, a really cool guy in Russia who made a, a USB version of Synergy because he, he needed to use Synergy on, an, on a network where uh, the, the two computers were um, on separate networks. So the easiest solution for him was to connect the two computers together with a USB cable and then write a, a USB protocol for Synergy. So he made that open source, of course, so we can obviously use that code if we want to make a USB version of Synergy should it become a popular demand. Have you thought about just... It, would it be a lot of work for you just to put it out now? Like, if you decide to just do it today... Would it be hard for you to to do that? Because portable versions of softwares are becoming more and more popular as time moves on. I know, like even audio DAW systems like Reaper have portable versions of it now, just because people are always carrying USB sticks. Heck, I have I think twenty seven of them sitting just behind me on a shelf. And a portable version of a KVM would always would always be appreciated to have. You know, I'm just because of Synergy being uh, uh, written the way it is, it can be used as a portable binary. Uh, that's quite a niche usage, though. It so, is. Yes. I mean, anybody who anybody who wants to put the, the Synergy binaries on a USB stick, it, they can actually use them that way by just running them from the command line. That's the great thing about Synergy is there's like a hundred different ways that you can hack it and customize it to do whatever you need. Right. Now, I did see on your website that you have you were talking about having a large number of high of high end clients or high profile kind of people who use Synergy. And in fact, if we go here, oh, well, that did not go the way I wanted. <laughs> the camera kind of bugged out there. But the you have Amazon, Google, Intel, Disney, Pixar, Microsoft, Apple, Cisco and Dell EMC all using this program. Did you ever envision the program being that being that well received? Well, when Chris wrote the first version, I can't speak for him, but I, I'm sure that 
he uh, he had no idea who would end up using it as its nature with open source. And when I started working on the software in 2009, I, I was just using it at home. I had no idea that it was being used at large corporations. And but that's that's the thing with open source is that like anybody anybody can use it and everybody will use it. So right, there's no, no right. Uh, there's no there's there's often there's no way of tracking who's using it. The, the only reason why we know who uses it is because of what email addresses people use and oh, okay. when, people, when people make business purchases, we obviously have to interact with them as a company. But um, yeah, before we started operating as a as a as a business selling open source software, we had no idea what companies were using the software. See, that's great. Like I never knew uh, until I saw the web page of how many big, large corporations. And I saw Disney on there. I'm like, never would have occurred to me that, you know, it, like I always think of Disney as the old hand-drawn animation studio. So it never really occurred to me that they would be needing KVMs like on this level. And I was so happy to see that they had picked Synergy as their KVM of choice. And well, they, a lot of these companies, they use multiple operating systems. Right. So Synergy is the only keyboard and mouse sharing software that works across all platforms. Right. So naturally, at larger companies where they do have a larger variety of operating systems, Synergy is the best choice for them because they only need to manage one piece of software. Very true. And you have made the install process for Synergy easier and easier over time. I remember when you added in the auto configuration feature, which just helped immensely in trying to get it all sorted. Yeah, you'll be glad to know that we're releasing version two of Synergy soon. And the main focus for version two is to make the auto configuration even more seamless. Very nice. Now, so you'll be, able to, you'll be able to configure Synergy, install and configure Synergy within a few clicks. Now, the one thing I do see people still wanting is an auto-updater. Yes, we'll have that as well. <laughs> okay, is that going to be in version 2? Yes, we okay, have Okay, okay, fantastic. Because I do remember, I'm like, that was the one thing even I was thinking, I'm like, I would love an auto. There's a bunch of softwares I use that don't have auto-updaters. And in fact, one of them is my, my DAW does not have auto-updater on it. Almost every time I open it up, it's like new version. I'm like, you know what? I don't. I don't need to edit this audio file today. I'm. I'm just. I'm good. I'm. I'm fine. <laughs> Absolutely. The, and and it's in our interest as a company to make the update process as seamless as possible because not only does it tie in with our mission statement, it actually makes makes people happier. Well, it makes more people install the update because. If you don't make the update process automatic and easy, not very many people update, and you have to spend a lot of effort trying to get people to update. So that is one of our top priorities. Right. To and do you find that's a do you find that's a big issue with your install base of people not updating to the newest version? Because I'm sure you can track the stats of who's launching the updates and not. Correct. Yeah. Synergy is very critical to many people's workflow. They depend on being able to use two computers with one keyboard and mouse. For, for somebody who's used to that, then having to risk breaking that configuration and going back to using two separate input devices is extremely painful for them. So a lot of uh, a lot of users choose to only update if they're having a problem, which we've told them that we're solving. Right. Like, actually, I had to format this machine we're doing the interview on right now. I had to format about two weeks ago because my entire registry system just up and died one morning. It was it was horrific. It was like it was like watching your loved ones get murdered. It was just terrible, and it broke my heart. And now I'm back to having to use a second a second mouse and. Until I get my synergy put back on, it's just like, oh my god, <laughs> like this is it feel now? <laughs> it, it's it's horrible. It's like I, I have to manage more things, and mm. I and once again, I like my life to be as seamless as possible. I I strive for that. My viewer base can even test to this. We have done everything in our power to make everything I do 
as easy and as transitional as possible. <laughs> transitional, I like that word. But having to use a separate mouse and a separate keyboard, <laughs> it's it's just it makes me just dread every day I have to go do something. I look up on the other monitor and I'm like, is there do I really need this other machine right now? Can I can I just do it on the one computer? So are you are you uh is installing Synergy on your priority list? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. As soon as I... Right now, I have a mountain of homework that's due in the next 24 hours. And as soon as that's done, Synergy is going back onto the machine. Okay. But right, I, I, right now, I'm still in the middle of uh, doing the install process for, you know, needed programs. And then I've been hemming and hawing on if I'm going to do the install update for Windows 10. Mm. Which, that on its own just worries me if something is going to break. <laughs> So, yeah, it okay. works if that helps. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know you guys were pretty much on top of the ball when Windows 10 came out. You guys were really quick to get the updates out to mm. make sure Microsoft that Microsoft are quite kind to us with Windows 10, and for that we're very thankful. Yeah, I'm I'm very thankful too because I know actually streamers had a real tough time when Windows 10 launched because yeah. OBS, which is the main software that we use for streaming did not get updates on day one. So OBS was breaking left and right for people who had done the update to Windows 10. So it was very nice when I saw companies like you making sure that, you know, we almost, that there was almost day one patches. Yeah. For it. And you said that you were a programmer and I'm assuming that means you work directly on Synergy. You're not just playing golf uh, over, over there in London. So what what made you like go into programming? Where did you go to school? What did you do with uh what made you want to get into it? When I was 12, 13 year old, I was fascinated by uh how to make a computer program. Of course, I'd been using computers um for a number of years before that. I I had uh I remember getting an Amiga A1200 for Christmas one year. And, uh, yeah, ever since that point, well, even before then, I was completely obsessed with computers. And I, I, it became a, an obsession of mine uh, from a very young age how to make a computer program just purely out of sheer curiosity. Uh, I, I was very lucky to have an opportunity when I was 13 to sell my first piece of software. Uh, ridiculously uh, low value piece of software. I think I made about a hundred pounds, which was worth something like $200 back then um, for like a month's work. Right. Uh, I was at school. So, you know, the, that was a lot of money to me, but over, over the years I, uh, I developed an entrepreneurial attitude towards work and worked a lot in my spare time. And, um, yeah, eventually I, I got a real job. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, as you normally tend to hear now from, from people in general of, yeah, like people now yeah. are actually, they're seeking those more creative style jobs. And even in something as we all know, the whole code monkey in a cubicle kind of days of old are still in people's minds, but you know, new new software companies nowadays are very progressive, very creative, very open kind of layouts and atmosphere. I'm assuming that's how it is over at over at your company. Yeah, at Seamless, we have a so we don't have the open plan office because it's not very popular with developers, and for good reason. You know, if you have too many people in one room, it gets very noisy. Okay. So, but at the same time, we don't have individual offices because people can get quite uh, isolated. So we we find that four four people in a room is a good number. Okay. Yeah. So, so we have we have four people per room in the office at the moment. And that that seems to be working out quite well. You know, if uh, if one room's getting too noisy, they can move into another one, or if they can close the door if uh, the other room's getting too noisy, and yeah, it works quite well. Well, that's that's fantastic and yeah like it doesn't have to be exactly open but definitely <clears throat> i know you're not doing the whole cubicle 
stay in this cubicle and that's that's all you're doing for this day. <laughs> yeah. No, that that's fantastic. And of course, like I said, you're located out in uh, London, London proper, right? Uh, we're just outside of London. Okay, just outside of. Uh, do you mind saying what city, or is it? There's that kind of like, I can tell you, but I have to kill you kind of information. No, we're in uh, <laughs> a town called Camberley in Surrey. Surrey. Okay. Okay. I know where Surrey is. I worked out in in Sussex for for a number of years. So okay, I know where that is. That's actually very, that's very neat. And I know that you had wanted to come to the States, but uh, taxes and all that make it better to stay over, over where you're at. We, we spent six months in the States, uh, a very small team from our company, to see what the difference was between the culture of working in the UK and the culture of working in the US, the costs, the opportunities, and so on. Uh, we actually had an office set in San Francisco. Wow. So how did you like your time in the U.S.? Yeah, it's great. Uh, people in San Francisco are very creative, very innovative, very risk-hungry. Mm -hmm. And um, the only thing is that it costs about twice as much money to actually run the company out there. I just, so, want, to I just want to point out, ladies and gentlemen, that's coming from a guy who lives in London. That saying it's too expensive to well, live London, out somewhere. London proper is quite expensive. Um, Surrey is quite affordable. Right. So yeah, I, I think I think London is uh, London's maybe a little bit less expensive than San Francisco. Okay. And yeah, I I think that uh, we assume that talent would be really really easy to find in San Francisco, but the problem is that the competition is so stiff. It's fierce out there. You know, people. People want to work for the the next Google yeah. sometimes, and it's, you have to. You ha it's a real hard sell to try and convince somebody to work for your company, and um, you know we we feel that what we're doing is very very important, but the uh, yeah the the problem is that that some people some people want the next Google. Yeah, no, and, and you know what, that's the type of, when you're only surrounded by the Silicon Valley and all the major companies out there, that mindset just kind of sets in on people, where it's just kind of, it's kind of comes with the territory kind of deal. But still, I, like I said, Synergy has just been fantastic, and I've I've known you guys for a, quite a while now, and can't imagine it would be that hard to, that hard to sell, but... I, I assume you're happier to be back in your in your home country. <laughs> yeah, I loved I loved being in America. It was yeah. it was a fantastic uh, fantastic experience, and the uh, you know I, I do I do miss the the kind of personalities that you come across. There's a much wider range of personality in America. Um, you have to work a lot harder to find that here in England. But at the same time, talent wise, like the intelligence of people is, is pretty much like the same as in America. Right. And I, I kind of figured that, you know, being in Silicon Valley, that you'd, you'd find the best talent in the world more easily. But actually it's, it's, it's just as hard over there to find the talent as it is over here. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it turns out when it, we were no better off being in, in San Francisco. We were just spending twice as much money. <laughs> now, now the big question does arise, though, since you were in America. Food comparisons. Who had mm -hmm. the better food? Well, taste is obviously very subjective. Yes, it is, but we're gonna no, still gonna, we're still going to put you on the spot for this one because I want to know. <laughs> I, I personally prefer the food that not necessarily American cuisine, but the food you can get in America. Right. So okay. San Francisco is great for Mexican food, yes. obviously, uh, and not just Mexican food. There's a whole range of, of food, and and that kind of uh, diversity is a lot harder to find in in the UK. But we are catching up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of burrito burrito restaurants popping up all over the place but Cam Camberley Surrey is um, 
it's probably one of the more innovative towns in terms of foods in in Surrey. Right. Along with maybe Camberley, uh, Guildford, and uh, Reading, which is where Microsoft are based. They they have uh, they have some uh, more adventurous food, but I mean, it, it's nothing compared to London. Right. No, I, I'm always curious whenever I hear like people from like other lands coming to America. It's like, okay, so you've come from your country, which is great, but now here is America. If you can think it, it it's on a plate somewhere in this city. You can find it. Yeah. <laughs> like, tell me that you tried the deep fried butter. Deep fried butter. Yes, America has has a dish called deep fried butter, and it is exactly what you think it is where where can you get that from at any state fair <laughs> okay i'll, uh, I'll go to any it. carnival or state fair in america you will find deep fried x okay and the x could almost be literal in fact if you can manifest an x they will deep fry that too <laughs> yeah i think scotland has deep fried mars bars uh, yeah oh yeah yeah no Amer- america's had the deep fried mars bar stinkers bar any type of chocolate we've had that for years <laughs> in, in fact we have whole shows here in america called carnival eats where the guy just goes around trying carnival food and mm-hmm. we say it that way because while you have mexican and korean and asian carnival food is its own cuisine <laughs> <laughs> so i take it you never got to actually try the deep fried butter then based on your reaction <laughs> I'll make sure if you ever come back to Northern America, I will make sure I find you a place that sells deep fried butter. <laughs> Just make sure you have somebody to take you to the hospital pretty much immediately. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's awesome, though. And I'm so glad to hear that the software is is just ex- just blowing away expectations. And even with the other competitors on the market, Seamless is still making such big waves through by what like you said being cross platform literally through all platforms and having the ability to move move and copy paste and all that other stuff it just it removes so many hurdles that you would have to otherwise set up i feel that the the thing that our competitors don't get is firstly how important open source is mm-hmm. and secondly how important linux support is yeah I, I've been trying to stress that to to one of my clients about the just the absolute importance of Linux, and I I get constantly met with the with the aversion of it's such a small demographic versus the Windows demographic. It's not worth it. I'm like, no, this is the way things are going. Linux is going to rise. <laughs> It well, might not, you, it might not uh, be instantaneous, but it's going to rise. <laughs> why do you think that Linux support is so important? Because Linux support is, it's one of those things that as people are, it, it's kind of looking at, if you take, if you take a child, you don't give them a very premium toy right away. You give them something like Fisher Price. It's very simple. It's very easy. It's user friendly. And you don't have to know a lot about it. By and large, that's Mac and Windows. <laughs> like, they do all the work for you. You don't really have to do more than what's on the surface for yourself. When it gets to Linux, though, there's much more involvement. There's much more detail that you can dive into. Make it your own in in almost every capacity. And with the whole maker movement that's going through North America right now, I'm not sure if it's traveled to your part of the world. But right, give it have- a <laughs> Yeah, it, but it's one of those things that people are very much delving into Linux now with Raspberry Pis, Arduino systems. It's one of those things that people are very much finding more and more appealing as they find the customizability for that for that system. They can really tailor it to a very niche and specific need while not actually having to put a lot of financial investment up themselves. And that's why I always try and stress that Linux is such an important system to cater to now. Do you think there's going to be more hackers going forward? In what respect? In, in society? People, I, you know, make this? I, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. I, I would definitely see a rise. 
especially with just the way the whole let's call it political environment's been going there's a lot of statements that are being thrown out that's kind of as we all know just never provoke the internet there's some things you just don't do that's that's one of them <laughs> and when you launch a thing like challenge accepted they tend to they tend to really rise up and show you what they're made out of and I feel like that's kind of one of those things that we're going to see a lot more people wanting to learn this stuff because they're wanting not to learn how to hack directly, but they're wanting to learn how to defend themselves from other attacks. But the only way you can ever really know that is knowing how to do it to start off with. So, what do you what do you think about multiple devices in the future? Do you think there will be more devices that people will have access to? Do you think it's going to be more common for people to have both a, a tablet, a laptop, and a, some kind of more powerful high-end machine? Or do you think that it's going to go the other way, that devices are going to be more consolidated? I I want to say could device, it's actually going to be kind of a mix of the two for a little bit there, where we have things like the Microsoft Surface Book, where it is a laptop, it is a tablet, but depending on what configuration you have it in, it can morph on its own. Right now, we're seeing people have the triple devices, high-end PC, laptop, and tablet. Myself is a prime example of that. I literally have all three. But over time, the way we have been moving to, in technology, I see it becoming more consolidated. I see people wanting to kind of meet in the middle at a very happy medium. And it's looking more like the tablet, laptop, ish era is going to be where we land there and then i feel that the phones will always be on their own but at that same time though something like synergy can be used still in that environment because you can pass files and windows from one place to another and i think for your kind of software that would be just be one of those things that you'll never really have to worry about not having people use it. in fact if anything it's just going to get more wanted over time because we saw we saw already in the phone era that the samsung want to say galaxy s2 possibly s3 where it had the two the touch and pass files from one from one phone to the other yeah but that was a samsung only exclusive feature whereas synergy could have done that all right there are a lot of uh, exclusive features like that that help devices um help users use devices together. Like for example, Apple handoff yep. is very, is quite a not very well known, but very cool feature. Yeah. And also you, you can, you can copy and paste between uh, your Apple devices as well. So, so it looks like Apple have a very similar view on multi using multiple devices to seamless. Mm-hmm. Uh, Except it's exclusive to Apple. <laughs> well, and that's just it, though. Ex exclusivity nowadays is really not something I feel is conducive to absolute success anymore. Where exclusive used to be the way you maintained your stranglehold on the market. We've gotten to the point where if a company says we have an exclusive, somebody as good as you comes out and says, well, we have it for everything. <laughs> And it kind of just shifts the focus in the market more towards the more towards your sector than than to the individual private one that was trying to be monopolized. In fact, the chat channel says, until technologies like VR and AR, holographic projection, uh, and all that good sci-fi style stuff, people are always going to have the standard bundle of PC, laptop, and or mobile device. And how do you feel that this is going to progress forward? Do you feel that we're going to meet towards a happy medium, or do you feel that we're always going to diverge out? into like the triple into the triple ownership it's very difficult to say you'll see a lot of developers now that don't have a desktop okay so they, they do tend to be uh, more often than not web developers okay. who work with uh, interpreted languages like uh, PHP Python that kind of thing right um, whereas programmers who work with compiled languages like C++ and so on they they tend to need the more powerful hardware. Right. And and so 
and especially with cross-platform development, yes, you can you can use a, a Mac and have a, a VM with Windows, but a lot of people find that running VMs on, say, a laptop is uh, the hardware isn't quite powerful enough for them to get as seamless and fluid an experience as what they get with having two separate physical machines. Right. So right now, it looks like the virtualization era is growing, but it's not going to be like an overnight change. I think we're going to see a very progressive change over the next maybe few years to everything being virtualized and the uh, all operating systems be able to run on one laptop, just like it's separate machines. And uh, until that happens, developers are going to prefer having a desktop metal hardware. Right. In fact, that's one thing we have been seeing now is the fact that NVIDIA has been putting their desktop class graphics processors into laptops now. Mm -hmm. And we're getting more mainstream. I know some laptops even have full blow and desktop processors like CPUs inside of them now. So yeah. we are seeing that hardware kind of meld into itself. Where yeah. We're getting away from the mobile and desktop and we're just having the one, the one being used across all platforms. Yeah, but the virtualization, I agree that I just I'm never really comfortable running it on a laptop. I do prefer the desktop experience more. Yeah, and I think virtualization, that's that's one thing that we really need to work on is having more people that do virtualization softwares, because <laughs> right now we have the the one main one that's out on the market. And it's one of those markets that's really open to another person stepping into the marketplace and kind of staking their own claim to it. So there is that. But with the respect to desktop, and you said programmers, I'm sure you've programmed both on a laptop and a desktop. Mm -hmm. And I've tried programming on my laptop. I really have. I can't do it. I I absolutely hate it in like every capacity. How did you, how, would you have a preference for which one? Not based on hardware, just based on actual like, usability well like like if i was doing a, an interpreted language like uh python mm -hmm. I, I would feel fairly comfortable with using a laptop um because you don't have to wait for anything to compile so compile time isn't an issue so having a a, a laptop which is typically relatively low powered wouldn't be an issue um, right. but if i'm using a, a language like c plus plus which needs to be compiled uh, it, it feels like you're wasting a lot of time waiting for the processor to compile. And, and for if, if you spend the same amount of money on a laptop as a desktop, you'll get a lot more power mm -hmm. for your. And, and generally, when you're when you're uh, when you when you're waiting for something to compile, you, you, the longer it takes, the the more distracted you get. Right. So you really need something quick. And um, you know, uh, screen size is a thing as well. So, you know, you're going to have to plug your laptop into external monitors, which means you're not going to carry those monitors around with you. And so you might as well have a, a static piece of hardware. So, yeah. Right. No, I, I totally get it. Well, that's that's always good to know. So is there any more updates before we wrap up today's interview that you want to tell us about Synergy? Hmm. I would say that the main focus right now for Synergy is stabilization. And a lot of users are going to be very, very happy for that. Though we are also developing version 2 of Synergy, primarily for the ease of configuration. OK. So those are the two focuses at the moment, is stabilization and ease of configuration. OK. And that's pretty much what we're focusing on right now. Um, new feature-wise, yeah, we do have a lot of features in the pipeline, but I don't want to announce them uh, because it's don't, quite I'm going to just tell you right now, just don't. The, yeah. <laughs> uh, believe me, I watch enough companies make that mistake where I try yeah. and just tell people not to just say anything. <laughs> just to, uh, It's great you have it in the background. Let's just leave it there until it actually comes out. Because the last thing you want to do is have the viewer base revolt and say, you said this, and it's no longer here. What happened? 
Yeah. We've watched enough. We'll, we'll, we'll show update definitely is coming. <laughs> yes. No. As as gamers, we have watched enough bodies in that lane to just know not to do it anymore. <laughs> The, bot, the corpse of Blizzard Activision, I'm sure, is still there from a few years back. But that's been great, guys. Uh, so this has been Nick Bolton with the CEO of Seamless. And if you guys want to check him out, by all means, it is... What's the URL? It's Seamless.org? Yeah, spell S-Y-M-L-E-S-S.com. And if you guys want the link, it will be in the, in the description down below. If you do want to check it out, you can get the wow just <laughs> this system just does not want to work with me at all today oh that's why there we go <laughs> if you guys do want to check it out the basic version is 19.99 the pro version is 29.99 and as mr bolton said features will be moving from one version to the other over time this is currently a legacy thing and i'm sure they're going to have something more robust coming with version 2 Possibly in the future, right? Yeah, and if you purchase the basic version, then we will grandfather those features and you will have access to them. Well, so you, don't to, you don't need to worry about losing the features. That is fantastic to hear. So, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been Button Mash. I want to thank Mr. Bolton here for joining me today. Thanks. I know it's very, very late over there, possibly almost midnight. So, uh -huh. hopefully... Uh -huh. <laughs> hopefully you won't have too much trouble getting to work in the morning tomorrow but yes thanks so much for joining me guys i have been little rex this has been mr bolton and this has been button mash thank you so much for tuning in like comment share and subscribe and i will see all of you next time bye